Hi Notboard Gamers and welcome back to Notboard Gaming. I'm your host, I'm Mark. Now in today's video we're going to be previewing a game that's currently on Kickstarter. It came to Kickstarter I think on the 28th of March and we're now just on the 1st of April and the game is Crown of Ash by Richard Lawton and Card Noir Games. Now it is a game for one to four players, that's right, it's got a solo mode and of course today I'm going to be talking about the solo mode in uh, Crown of Ash. And what is Crown of Ash? Well, it is a game that is a worker placement game. It's set collection, it's resource management, you're building structures and you're having fights as well. So there's quite a lot of mechanisms going on in here and kind of the basic premise is, is this, this distant land uh, and it was once ruled over by a mighty king who had four lords working for him, but he became jealous of the power that the lords wielded. They had a great partnership going. Um, so he spread lies by his spies amongst the land and effect effectively kind of took all the power away from the lords. They were given a vial which made them sleep for about a hundred years. And when they rose again, they'd been transformed into these kind of vicious creatures with one singular purpose in mind. And that was to take over all of the land. And that kind of gives you the basic background premise of that, uh, of the game itself. Uh, and as you can see, I've got everything spread out in front of me here. Now, as I say, it is a one to four player game. Uh, obviously, if you're playing above um, one player, then it's a competitive game. Um, and as a solo player, you're going to be playing against an AI. And if you're playing multiplayer, you can also introduce the AI as another uh, as another player in the game itself. So that's kind of the overview of the game. As I say, it's on Kickstarter right now. I know it's already funded and rightfully so, so the link will be in the description below. So let me take you to the table, let me show you what Crown of Ash is and how it plays as a solo game. So we've got everything set up here for kind of the start of a solo game. So here we have the main board and it is double sided. So depending on the artwork that you want to play with, uh, you can use either side of the board itself. And then you have various kind of um, uh, areas here which you're, going to con which you're going to try and control because it does have an element of area control in here as well. In the center of the board is the citadel. The citadel is really important. Whoever is in control at the end of the citadel uh, sorry, the Citadel at the end of a round will score whatever points are on this board depending on what what round it is and there are four rounds in a game as well. So the Citadel becomes really important. The AI is going to start off in the solo game in control of that. In the multiplayer game there's the king that goes on there. At the top of the board you have some fighters and you get to raise these fighters so you can raise them from the dead and they come into your army and there's a different strength class. So the first three cards up here are the level one fighters, the next two is level two fighters Fighter. and the third the one over in the far right is a level three fighter of course they take more resources to kind of uh, to raise from there for you to get those and you have decks of them here ready to put out there when as and when you take cards from there so that's level one level two level three so you're replenishing those as you are raising your fighters and the aim of the game is simple you have to score more points than your opponents and how do you score points well at the end of each round you're going to get points for each area that you control and the structures that are on there and you can see these little cards down here these little tiles these are structure cards and let me just show you one of these so you start off with kind of four available and they're random from the uh, level one structures and you also get level two structures in there and if you look on these when you build these structure cards what happens is is uh first of all you pay the cost in the top left corner this is going to cost one gold uh, and you would instantly get if you build it the resources that are on there which is for uh, for i think that's um bone ash uh, sulfur and blood so that is uh, that will be an ash card uh, ash uh, resource there uh, so you get that instantly then whenever you go on that space throughout the game you would also gain those four resources there down here is the points value so at the end of the round you can take that points value so that one is worth two but if you're building structures on top of structures so say for example i'd already had three structures on there and i built a fourth one on there it's highly unlikely i would get two three four five so you get points for each structure underneath the one that you've got on there as well and that will come on in, in the later game basically now over here in the right hand side is a tax space so 
you, you can use this space to get those, but if your opponent uses those, this space to get those resources, and you own this particular structure, so you, you own the area for it, then you will get you will receive these as a tax. And I think these are uh, bone. Yeah, these are bone resources, the white resources. So you get to kind of optimise what resources you're getting when you go on there. And why are resources important? Well, of course, you want to start raising those fighters. So we have a look at a level one and a level three fighter from up here. And we can see that to raise this level one fighter at any point, well, at the point in the, uh, on my turn, I have to spend two blood. That's two red ones there. And that will give me a fighter that's got two combat points on there. And combat is a key part of the game. But also take note of kind of the set that it's in because you can get additional combat points if you have matching sets of fighters going into combat. And if you look at the level three one here, you can see it's got massive six combat points. It's got a white set there, but it's gonna cost me five ash, uh, sorry, five bone, four ash, and three blood to get that. So you have to try and rack up those resources as you play through the game. And also you get to accumulate gold as well. So this is gold and gold is the most precious of all resources, acts as a wild resource, but it's limited. And there's only certain actions or certain places you can go on there that will give you a gold. There is a particular spot on the board where you can place your worker and get a gold. And you're gonna start the game with four workers. And each round, uh, you will take it in turns with you going first and then the AI to place one of your workers. And that's either going to be to gather resources, it's going to be there to build a structure, it's going to be on these here where you can see the uh, little kind of cross swords to initiate combat because you want to take over an area or you can place it on this little spot on your board and refresh your combat cards and we'll talk about combat cards in a second. So there are effectively only four, uh, four moves for you in a particular game. The AI is going to move from a simple set of five AI cards and they're going to be shuffled basically and then you're going to draw one of those and you're going to work from left to right until you can do a particular action. So here, for example, you would build. So if, if it can build a structure, it would build a structure. If it can't perform this action, it moves on to the next action. And that would say, right, so what it's going to do is it's going to collect a resource from the space that's indicated. Uh, and it's going to raise a fighter. And how does it raise a fighter? Well, we have this card here. And as you can see on this card... Uh, this is for the AI, it, you know, on the first time it raises a fight, it raises a level one, then a level two, then a level two, and then a level three. So it will raise stronger fighters and its hand will increase throughout the game. And that's pretty much always the default action in these cards is that it will raise a fighter. So we can see here, this card, if it lands on a space that I control, it will initiate combat. If it lands on a space that it controls, it will build. If it can't do either of those actions, it will take the next resource, going clockwise from where it is, and raise a fighter. Here, it will attack the citadel. And as I say, that citadel is really important uh, for those points. So you want to get that as soon as possible and try and maintain that. Obviously, if it's in control of the Citadel, it will do the default actions. And same here, uh, we have another kind of, um, it will, uh, yeah, it will attack your area or if it controls the Citadel or if, if it controls your area, sorry, if it controls the area it is, it'll attack the Citadel or raise a fighter. So those are the kind of, there's only five cards. The default action is always to take, uh, to take a, um, a, uh, resource and then kind of uh, raise a fighter. So how do you know where to go? Well, the board is effectively set up into six areas. One, two, three, four, five, six. So every time for the AI, you're going to roll and it will choose an area. So for, say for example, there we go, it would go into this particular area here. You would flip the card, see what actions you can do there and see what you can gather from it. So it's a relatively straightforward AI to operate. So let's just kind of move into the initial kind of early stages of setting the game up. Uh, you always start uh, from your perspective, you're gonna have three starting fighters and they're identified by this at the bottom. They are zero power ones, okay? You're gonna have four workers on your board. You're going to have a board with a, uh, a score marker on the zero, just there. Uh, and you're going to have some combat cards as well, because when you initiate combat, what you're going to do is pick and choose one of these cards to actually 
uh, kind of boost your combat and provide rewards whether you win or lose. The AI has got a similar deck, but of course for the AI, what they're going to do is they're just going to flip the top one over and that's going to dictate their combat. You also, for you, you're going to have what's called a fate card and you will get additional points at the end of the game if you've got sets on these particular colors. So for example, in this game, I'd be looking at collecting the white set cards and also the yellow set cards because they would give me additional points at the end. Okay, and over here, as I mentioned before, we have the, the kind of board with the uh, fighter cards to go out on the top. We have the scoring, which goes up in rounds. You're always gonna go first. So if I control the Citadel at the end of the first round or the AI controls the Citadel at the end of the first round, Whoever controls it gets three points, four points, five points, six points. So it becomes quite, um, uh, quite important to control that citadel. So to start the game, what you're going to do is, because there's two of us playing, myself and the AI, I'm going to shuffle these. Uh, these are these starting um, structure tiles. And you can see they're starting because they don't have a number on there, a one or a two on there. I'm going to deal one each to myself and the AI. So I'm going to flip those over and these go on specific spots on the board. So there we go. So that is three black, which goes up there. So I put that structure tile there and I take one of my marker, my area control markers and put it there. So I've already got orange on there. The next one is this black and yellow, which is down here. So I will then be in control of that area. And that means the AI is going to be in control of that area and that area. We take the little green ones, well, the green in this instance is obviously different colors as well. And there we go, we can see who controls those areas on the board. Now you're gonna start with three starting fighter cards, okay? There's a two value combat card and then two one value combat cards, okay? So what you're gonna do on the areas you control is put your one value combat cards on there. The AI has got exactly the same. I'm gonna take their two singular combat value cards and put that on there. That means if I want to take over that area, I've got to, I've got to fight it with fighters that have more than one combat to try and beat it. Of course, I also have my uh, combat cards, uh, which can aid me. So for example, if I was to use this one, I'd roll a die and add that value onto the value of my combat, uh, my fighters I'm using in combat. Uh, if I was to win, I'd get a victory point, and uh, yeah, if I was to lose, I would get two gold. Here, uh, that would add four onto my value of combat. If I was to win, I'd get any resource, lose, get two gold. Here, I'd add three onto my value of combat. Win is to get a gold, two, lose to get any two resources. Here, I'd add zero on, and if I was to win, I'd get three gold. If I was to lose, I would then choose a fighter from the winner's hand, i.e. the AI's hand who defeated me and put them into their graveyard, which puts them out the, uh, effectively out of the, uh, out of the game for the rest of the round. Uh, and here we have a one and say, uh, kind of two gold and one resource. And you'll use those. And when they're used, they're going to the center of your board. When you've used them all, you take them back up and then you get to use them again, unless you use that space there, which allows you to then effectively refresh your combat cards. So here we go. We're on the board now and we have everything set up. And as I say, it's a strikingly easy game to play. And I think that's one of the real core strengths of this here is it just becomes such a very, very easy game to play. So I can do four actions. I can gather resources, I can build structures, I can initiate combat, or I can refresh combat cards early. Those are the only four actions that I've got. So kind of early on, oh, I have to know what I meant to do. We'll mainly set the Citadel up for the AI. Now you can choose which level of difficulty you want. For easiest, you choose a level one card. For uh, medium, you choose a level two card. And for the harder difficulty, you choose a level three card. So we'll choose a level one. And there you see, we've got a fighter that's got a strength of three on there. Now, just before we talk about combat and the rest of the game, each other area can be attacked only twice. And that can happen, maybe the AI's attacked it and taking it over, then you attack it and take it back. And maybe the AI wants to then attack it in the same round, but they can't because they can only be done twice, apart from the Citadel. That can be attacked as many times as possible. You get one attack, which allows you to increase your combat value by one. You get one attack, which maintains your combat value, and then any number of attacks which decrease your combat value by one. And that's really important that you don't over attack on there. So I say, you know, we're gonna start and we're gonna have a look at this. So I've got 
these two areas here and here. You're going to take your worker and you're going to choose an action. And what do I want to do? Well, I could effectively build. Maybe I, that increases my territory and I want to start thinking about collecting enough resources so I can battle that. And at the moment, all I've got is this here, which is this combat card with two value. So, and at the end of each turn, what you get to do is raise a fighter if you have enough, enough, um, uh, if you have enough resources. I've got two wild resources there. That doesn't do me a massive amount of anything on there, but what I could do actually is I could, yes. So we're gonna take my worker, and we're gonna put him on this spot here, I'll put them on this spot here, and I'm gonna instantly get three black resources. You store your resources on this side of your board. Just there. So now I have one, two, three resources, and also I have two gold as well. Now, because I've gone on a space that I actually own, what I could do is I could amend my fighters. I could change that one fighter for this two in my hand. Um, and maybe I'll do that just to strengthen that spot. Because I am going to get another two now. I'm going to raise this and get another two. So that's what we'll do. We're going to amend the fighter, and suddenly, my fighter has increased there. So there we go. We've amended that and I've got a one fighter here. So that's good. Now, what I can do is I can raise a fighter. If you look up here, that one would cost me two blood. That's two ash, that's one blood. They're way out my league, six uh, ash, two sulfur, one blood, five, uh, um, almost there with that, but not quite on that level two one there. Um, if I had another ash, I could have done that. Another, uh, yeah, another ash, I could have done that. And that's out of the way. So I'm going to raise this fighter just here. Now, it doesn't help my fake card, as you can see, because it's not white or, or, or yellow. It's black on there. But that's going to go into my kind of fighter area and I need to pay four resources. I've got three ash. I'm also going to play one gold. And there we go. I've got those fighters there. We're instantly going to refresh that. There we go. And that has, oops, that was level two. There we go. Uh, are they level twos? I've got those the wrong way around then. Oh. Instantly going to refresh that. There we go. And that means that now there is a new fighter up in that particular area. Okay, so that's the end of my first turn. Now we'll go on to the AI's turn. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to roll a dice. And that's six, so that's one, two, three, four, five, six. It's going into its own area. But what action is it going to do? Well, we're going to take these cards here. And we are going to do this. And here we go. So this is quite a good one to show you. So first of all, it's going to go into, it wants to go into this area. Now, it does say here that if, it, if I control that area, it would attack me. I don't. It controls it because it's green. It says then, okay, if it controls it, we attack the citadel. Well, it can't attack the citadel because it already controls the citadel. So therefore, we move on to this next action. And what it asks you to do is take the resource there or the next one clockwise. So we're going to put that up there. And that is three resources. But it doesn't collect resources. So what does it do instead? It collects victory points. So one, two, three. It's already moved up on the victory point marker. Leave that card out there. That, and then it's going to raise a fighter. We know that the fighter is going to raise is this level one, just here on this card. So it's got this handy little kind of raise fighter marker. We're going to raise a level one fighter. And what it does is it takes the furthest right in that particular area. So it's going to take this particular fighter and add it to its hand just there. We're going to flip that over put that on there and move that marker up. And that is the AI's first turn. As you can see, it works really, really, really quickly. Okay, one of the other actions you can do as well, as I mentioned, is to build a structure. You would put your worker in this structure. You would take one of these four tiles, pay the cost that's on there, and then place that structure around the board. You would then also obviously claim that structure as your own. So say, for example, in this one, I paid my singular gold. There we go. Uh, and I... Uh, took this one, which is a cost of one, and I put it there. I would take my resource marker, sorry, my area control marker, put that there, and I would then claim those two sulfur as mine. And that's how the structure tiles work. And the more you build them up, the more you go through it, the more you build them up, the more points they're worth at the end of the round for you. 
But the main, one of the main things that you're going to be doing in the game is combat. Now, so with combat, uh, let's, so let's initiate a combat for this particular go then. So I'm going to try and take over, just for the sake of it, the Citadel. I'm going to put my worker just there, okay? So I automatically know that I get a plus one on my combat values. I've got two fighters in my hand. I'm going to use both of those to try and defeat that particular Citadel there. And combat runs relatively smoothly. I've got the two cards in my hand here. I can use both of them. Now, if those colours matched, uh, I would get a bonus for it. With all of the other areas, uh, other than the Citadel, you're allowed to choose two fighters from your hand. At the Citadel, you're allowed to use three. If I had two matching colours, I would, vault, I would add up the combat value and add one to it. If I use three matching colours, I would add up the combat values and add two to it. I don't have any matching here. So I'm going to play these two cards because I really want that Citadel. So my three matches that three. Unfortunately, when you're attacking, meet it doesn't beat it. So I need to choose a card now. Now, do I really want to kind of use my four card or my three card? I really want to make sure that I get that Citadel. I've already got a plus one value, so that is four. So the maximum they can draw out, unless they draw the dice card and roll a six, is going to be a four. So I know I can still beat it if that's the case. So I'm going to choose this card, the four there. So suddenly my combat value is one, two, three, four for the extra one for attacking the Citadel on that space, plus that. That means I've got eight going in there. What the AI is going to do, we know they have a strength of three and they're going to flip over this card. And here we go, they have a zero, zero card there. So they are going to uh, lose this particular battle. So I know that's absolutely great for me. I'm gonna take my fighters that I used, which is these two fighters here, yeah? And I'm going to remove their fighter. That fighter goes into the graveyard and that's this right space on here. That means they can't use that fighter for the rest of the round. We take their area control token off there and we put my area control token on there. Now I got two cards and ordinarily what I would do is I would place those onto the Citadel. But if you look at the bottom here of the card that they chose as their combat card, I have to move one of my fighters to the graveyard. So I only get to the benefit of this. So I'm gonna move the lowest powered one onto my graveyard. That means they're out for the rest of this round, basically there. But it also means, obviously, I don't have that four combat card to use. So if combat is part of my strategy moving forward, I've lost that for the rest of the round. And here we go, we can see that I gain a resource of any type that I want. I want to start building up blood, I think, because I want to start having a look at some of the twos and threes. That goes on there. That's my go. Back to the AI for their go. Let's have a look. It's number two. So one, two, they're going to go in this area here, which is unfulfilled at the moment. So let's flip a card over and it says they're going to gather resources to start off with. Well, nobody owns that area to start off with just now. So what they're going to do is they're going to take one of their workers and move that worker onto there. And they're going to get in, gain two victory points. One, two. There we go. Nobody owns that area, they don't control it, they've just gathered the resources. So that for me, um, you know, didn't hurt me too bad, but they have gained more victory points and so on until all of your four workers have done. What you will do is you will then get to the end of the round and for the end of the round, you're gonna score for your control structures. So you would score, depending on what you control, as would the AI, they would score for wherever they've got their control marker, plus the value on there, plus a one for any structure tile underneath it. You're gonna resurrect your fighter from the graveyard. So my fighter that I discarded will go back into my hand. Same for the, um, for the AI. You're gonna retrieve your minions, so all the workers come from the board, and then you refresh the structure tiles. So what would happen is those four would be clean out of the way and you would unveil a four new structure tiles and then you would go again and you would carry on until all four rounds are up. Of course, for scoring for structures, let's not forget the Citadel and at the end of the first round, me controlling that Citadel is worth three points. So additional scoring for end of game is you score for resources. So you would get a victory point for every two gold that you have left at the end of the game. So if you haven't spent all your resources, that can be worthwhile for you. And every three matching resources, so if I've got three of these at the end of the game, that would also give me a victory point. And then you're also going to score for your fate card as well. Uh, so if I've got a mix of white fighters at the top and yellow fighters, 
I would score the appropriate Roman numeral value, one, two, or three, depending on what level they are, at the top of each card at the end of the game as well. And then whoever's got the most points has got victory. As I say, very easy to learn game, but that doesn't mean that, uh, you know, it doesn't have a good amount of depth there. And there we go, that's a very brief overview on how, <clears throat> excuse me, Crown of Ash from Richard Lawton and Card Noir Games works. <clears throat> And I say very brief, obviously, you know, it's not a solo playthrough. If you want to watch a solo playthrough, then go and check out Mark Monk's excellent channel, Ninja Geek Gaming, where Mark <clears throat> does do a, so, a full solo playthrough of Crown of Ash. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, as I say, it's got uh, kind of worker placement, hand management, set collection, area control, all within there. And it sounds complex on the face of it, but it's not. It's a surprisingly easy game to learn to play. Um, and the great thing about the solo is that you can play it in round about 45 minutes to an hour. So I will and have been playing a couple of games of this on the bounce. So you've got varying difficulties for it, depending on what level card you put out for the AI onto the Citadel at the beginning of the game. And then even if you find that you're beating the third level of difficulty, then put two cards out there and increase that. But tell me, trust me, I moved from beating the, uh, the first level fairly easily uh, and I moved straight to the hardest level, and I got my butt kicked quite severely on that. And that is a good thing about the game, is that, you know, there's not one true strategy that wins in this game. So you may want to focus on kind of building up your fighter's hand on a combat-heavy strategy, or maybe it's resource-heavy to get those, um, to ensure that you've got enough resources to get the cards, not necessarily for combat, but for end-of-game scoring. Or maybe it's area control, and getting into that citadel is really important. At four rounds, it's perfectly paced. And I think that's a really good thing for it. Sometimes with worker placement games, you tend to find that they either outstay their welcome or that they're paced in such a way that just as your engine's getting going, the game comes to a, a crashing end. And that's not the case with Crown of Ash. I think that the kind of, you know, the four rounds and the pacing of it is really, really, really good. I think in terms of, you know, the solo AI, for those of you that love a simple AI, it doesn't get much more relevant and simple than that and just because it's simple it doesn't mean it's bad yes there's a, you know with only having five cards there is the opportunity <coughs> to have an element of understanding of what the next actions are going to be as you go through those cards and that's pretty much in life like understanding a, um, a another player's kind of strategy and working towards that the dice rolling to determine where you go next is not my favorite mechanism it works in the context of this game um, but I'd like to potentially have seen a more structured way in where it chooses to go. I mean, there are only six options, so the die makes perfect sense to do that. Uh, and one thing I'd certainly like to have seen is some asymmetry on the player boards. All of the combat cards are exactly the same, which is great. That means that, you know, teaching the game and playing with people, uh, you know, you've all got an even chance of winning. It's your strategy inside that that does that. But potentially I'd like to have seen a bit of asymmetry in there. Obviously, this is a prototype that I've got in front of me, so these are not the finished versions, but it's a very, very well made prototype. And I know that the rules are being updated as well. So Richard emailed me on Friday with some changes to the rules. One of the key ones being is that if you lose a battle and one of your fighters was one of your starting cards, which has a kind of zero uh, on there, which is a nothing on there, then you get to raise a level one fighter uh, for, uh, to put into your deck, which is good because that helps certainly with balancing out sometimes the speed at which the AI can start increasing their uh, increasing their fighters. But overall, I've had a great time with this game. I, you know, I think if you're looking for a worker placement game that's not too complex that has other connecting mechanisms in there that you don't want it to be the bulk of your game night. You know, because even with four players, you're probably gonna get this, get through this in just over an hour because it moves along at a really snappy pace. So, you know, this is an ideal game for that. It's not, you know, in terms of introducing people into worker placements and mechanisms, it's really good because the rules are so simple. Those four actions really, really help. The scoring's not complex, etc. And it's got that kind of combat element and battle element in there as well, which is really good. It's semi-deterministic. You know going in what cards you've got to go in there. It's just your combat cards then that can add the, add the, the kind of variant onto there. And of course, from the solo AI, 
what they're doing is they're randomly and blindly drawing from their combat cards to, to do that. So it adds an element of the unknown there. So I really like Crown of Ash. Um, you know, I think the artwork is great. The components are great. It's exactly what it needs to be. Uh, and in a world full of relatively complex worker placement and action selection games, you've got something here that's streamlined. It's got its kind of core mechanisms down to a fine art and it really, really, really works. And I think the solo experience, say, play it in about 45 minutes, you'll easily play a couple of games on the bounce and have a great time doing it. So yeah, do make sure you check out the Kickstarter. The link is in the description below. It's already funded. Let's see if we can get it even further along there. If, the sound, if this sounds like something you'd like to get to your table, <coughs> then go and check out the, the Kickstarter. You know, I think what Richard's done here is, as I say, create a wonderful streamlined game with interconnecting mechanisms and easy to handle AI that just kind of you know, hits the right notes on every single one of the mechanisms that you're striving to achieve. So thank you very much for joining me on this preview of Crown of Ash. As I say, it's a Kickstarter now, designed by Richard Lawton and from Card Noir Games. My name's Mark. This is Not Board Gaming. Don't forget to like and subscribe to the channel. Check out our other videos. And one final thought, if you can't find anyone else to play with, there's nothing wrong with playing with yourselves. Until next time, bye-bye.